I want to welcome everyone who is attending. Uh, going to be a very good afternoon with Mike Brack, and we're so pleased that you're joining us. I'm Pam Ramsden, manager of Coming of Age, and I have a wonderful technical support person named Cindy in the background. So even though we couldn't get our little PowerPoint going in the beginning, that just gives us more time to hear Mike. So I would like to let you know that he will do his presentation. And at the end, you'll have an opportunity all along. If you want, you can type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, but at the end, we will unmute you. And if you want to ask my questions directly at the end, then you may do it at that time. So let me give you a little bit of background for Mike and introduce him. He's a 38 year veteran of the financial services industry and lives in Toronto. Yay, Canada. <laughs> he started his own victory lap in 2014 and is currently working with his wife, an investment advisor, also known as the Contessa, uh, helping her clients design their own fulfilling retirement lifestyles. Mike is a best-selling author, award-winning blogger, public speaker, and retirement lifestyle designer, and I must say an expert on retirement at this point. His retirement blog articles can be found at boomingencore.com. His bestseller Victory Lap Retirement was based on the realization that traditional full stop retirement doesn't work for most people anymore due to increasing longevity. The book presents a new life model better suited to today's reality. His follow up book, Retirement Heaven or Hell, which was released in January of this year, shows people how to design and transition to their own unique retirement lifestyle. The book also outlines the valuable retirement lessons learned from the pandemic and introduces the nine retirement principles for a long, healthy, fulfilling life. So Mike, tell us how we can head for in that direction. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Thank you everyone for uh, letting me talk to you today. I, I really uh, enjoy doing presentations like this to uh, fellow retirees and boomers. And I apologize for the way my hair looks and, and my beard because the barber shops still aren't open up here in Toronto. So my wife's been trying, but she's, she still has to practice a little bit more, I think. But uh, yeah, these are these are uh, you know you know stressful and, and challenging times that uh, we're all going to go through and. You know, we're, we're getting closer to the finish line. So I'm so happy with that. But what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, my new book, Retirement Heaven or Hell. It uh, was just released in January. And basically what it does is it tells us uh, the story about my own retirement transition, about how I failed early at uh, retirement and ended up in retirement hell and how I uh, eventually got out of that place. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite ex exciting. And after reading the book, you'll know a lot more about yourself and what you want to do in retirement. And, and better yet, you'll, you'll realize what kind of person that you want to be when you actually do retire and get there. So I believe, I, you know, I tend to look at retirement differently than a lot of people. I came up with my own uh, new beliefs after, you know, writing the two books. And one thing I, I, I believe is that we're all getting two lives. And our first life begins, uh, you know, the day we were born. And it covers that period when we're growing up and, you know, we go to school for a number of years. And after school, you know, we go out and find a job. And we try to make as much money as we can so, you know, we can support our families and save a little bit for retirement. And our second life starts uh, after we retire or that decision is made for you like it was made for me by my employer when I was pushed out of my banking job. And that's, uh, that's when the excitement starts because a lot of us believe retirement will be like it was for our parents and our grandparents. And it, and it isn't because uh, you know retirement um, isn't the same. It's changing all the time. And the important thing to understand is because of increasing longevity, 
people are living longer. Out of necessity, retirement's uh, changing right before our eyes. And uh, new uh, hybrid forms of retirement are, are being developed all the time. And many of them contain uh, a work component to them. And because of this new reality, because of, of this, you know, th you know, this, these fundamental changes to old traditional style retirement, what we're trying to do is, is, you know, change the way people view retirement. And we don't want them to look at it as a finish line, as a, you know, a goal, a big goal that's finally reached. What we want them to do is look at it instead as a, as a starting line, as a new beginning as a, a second life where you know everything opens up for you and you can do all kinds of things but it's hard for people to see it that way because the advertisers keep trying to convince us that you know what people should uh, you know look forward to is is a life based 100 percent on leisure but what we want them to do is is look at it as a, a chance to create an optimum uh, lifestyle based on uh, you know, a good mix of uh, work uh, and uh, leisure and adventure. But uh, it's hard because you know, the advertisers keep showing us their old style commercials. And we've been seeing the same commercials for the last 50 years. The only difference being that instead of black and white, they're in color, but the messaging's all been the same. And I'm sure we've all seen these commercials here where you know, the, you, the, you know, you got to understand the people in these commercials aren't real retirees. They're just models. And so they're showing us models sitting on the beach and the sun's going down and everything's wonderful. Many times you'll see them drinking the Corona, some other type of beer, and you'll see the models, they're playing golf or the models are on some yacht somewhere in the Caribbean, uh, you know, sailing and everything's just wonderful. But Real retirement isn't like that for a lot of people. And we know it because we can't identify with those models. So we know our retirement's not gonna be like that. And it's frustrating because who's gonna spend 365 days on the beach? No one. Who's gonna spend 365 days golfing? No one. And, you know, it's with that, you know, you know, looking at reality and knowing that that's not true, I, I think it causes so much confusion and stress for people. And if I had my way, when they show these commercials on TV, uh, they would put a warning label, similar to what they do with drug, uh, you know, uh, company commercials, warning about the dangerous side effects of a poorly planned retirement, side effects such as uh, acute stress, acute anxiety, a possible divorce, poor health, or e even early death. You know, these are all things that could happen in retirement if you're not planning it properly and you're not executing properly. I like this picture because it reminds me that uh, unlike cows, not all retirees are the same. Yet the advertisers would like us to believe that we all want the same things in retirement, and that's not true. There's different types of retirees. You know, one type are comfort-oriented retirees. These are the people that viewed retirement as the finish line for them. And once they reach that finish line, they just want to sit back and relax and enjoy life. They, uh, they don't want to set any goals and they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. They just want to enjoy a safe, predictable retirement. And they enjoy living the simple life. My mother was a comfort-oriented retiree. And what she loved doing was just taking care of her family, uh, you know, hanging out with her friends whenever she could and watching some soaps on the TV in the afternoon. You would never see my mother go out and run a marathon or travel to different countries of the world and experience new things. That just wasn't her. And it worked for her and there's nothing wrong with that. But that type of retirement lifestyle wouldn't work for me because I'm a growth oriented retiree. I need to keep learning and experiencing new things and keep stretching and, and having variety in my life. Professor Abraham Maslow um, 
you know, describe people such as me as, as self-actualizers, people that were always in the process of becoming, and that process was a never-ending story. And that's exactly how it feels for me. And those are the needs that I need to satisfy on a regular basis, or I'm not going to be happy in retirement. And then there's the third type. And it's, a lot of people did know this, that Professor uh, Maslow, near, near uh, the time of his death, was working on changing his famous hierarchy of needs. And he was going to put an even, even higher level of psychological development, a level above a, um, self-actualization. Uh, and he was going to call it self-transcendence. And transcenders are people that have a need to give back to the community in some fashion. They have a strong need to help others. And you saw this during the pandemic when, you know, boomers and retirees would put up their hand and they would volunteer to work at the food banks or at the vaccination centers and things like that. And they would offer to help their elderly um, neighbors who were too scared to go to grocery stores to shop. And they would put up their hand and say, hey, I'll go do the shopping for you. But that's, you see, that's their need. They need to find ways of doing this. And you'll see transcenders, you know, do a lot of volunteer work because that makes them feel good in retirement. I think it's, it's very important that people realize that just because you, you hit the age of 65 and you retire, you're not done yet. There's still a long way to go. And you have uh, maybe 30 plus years of active living ahead of you. And it's, it's very important to understand that you're not going to be the same person in five years or 10 years or 20 years after you retire. You're going to keep changing. And what you need to do is to figure out the type of person that you want to be and then work on changing into that person. I think a lot of us forget how long 20 to 30 years actually is. It's a real long time. Just think about that period when... When, when you were born and, and the, the amount of time it, it uh, took to cover 21 years. Like, it's just amazing. And that's what you're looking in front of you. But you got to watch out because, you know, they try to brainwash you into thinking a certain way and, and it's wrong. For instance, I used to believe that a person's most productive period was in their 20s and 30s. Because that's all they say, the young people, you know, they do all the amazing things. But I really don't believe that anymore. Based on what I see other successful retirees doing these days, I believe our most productive and creative period is in our 60s. And that period of uh, productivity and creativity can continue into our 70s and even our 80s if we know what to do and play our cards right. So it's very important to understand that. This is a diagram out of uh, Retirement Heaven or Hell, and I use it at all my retirement seminars. And it's a good depiction of the process a person goes through as they transition in retirement. All three retirees at point A are happy when they, just after retirement. And they're happy because they don't no longer have to uh, set an alarm in the morning, get up early and go to work. And they no longer have to endure a long, brutal commute to work. And at the end of the day, they're not feeling uh, you know, wiped out from working hard all day long. And um, even better, they don't have to take orders from a boss anymore. They're free to do whatever they want. They're as free as a bird. And they can spend their time any way they want. They can spend more time with the grandkids or they can spend time you know, going you know, golfing or traveling or whatever they want. But this is important to understand. At some point, some retirees, not all of them, not the comfort ones, because they enjoy being where they are. It's the growth-oriented and transcenders that are going to get uncomfortable because they're going to feel a need for something more in their life, something more fulfilling, something more challenging, something more meaningful. And until they deal with that, they're going to start sliding down into retirement hell. In retirement hell is a terrible place. You know, I've been there. Uh, my father was in there when he retired for a period of time. And I had a good friend actually die from being in retirement hell. He never did recover from it. And when you're in retirement hell, you feel like you're in a fog. 
because you can't think straight and you're, you've, you're very vulnerable to everything. And uh, it, it's a very stressful period. I remember when I was packaged off from my banking job and I received their severance check, I was the happiest guy in the world because uh, I, you know, I, I reached a point where I didn't really like uh, working there anymore. Uh, you know, I, I found the work boring because I knew how to do it well. So I wasn't learning anything new. And even some of the people I was working for, I didn't enjoy anymore. So I was planning on leaving anyways. And when I received that check at age 59, I felt like I had won the lottery until the next uh, uh, Monday morning hit. And that's when uh, things changed for the worst for me. And I love this picture because it really, it mirrors how I felt that Monday morning. I remember sitting on the couch all by myself because my wife was still working. So she had left me all alone at home. And uh, I have this, you know, fancy TV. I think there's 500 stations on this silly thing. But do you think I could find anything interesting to watch that day? You know, when you're in, in retirement hell, you know, you don't feel like doing anything, you know? And, uh, you know, things that you used to enjoy, you don't feel like doing either. Like, you know, I enjoyed going, uh, riding my bike. I didn't feel like doing that. I enjoy fishing. I didn't feel like doing any of those things. And even the smallest task that you have to do, like go to the post office and pick up the mail or, you know, cutting the lawn or something, it seems like the, a huge problem because you don't feel like doing anything at all. And, I, you know, at that point, I couldn't even go hang out with my friends because all my friends basically were work friends that were still working. So I, I couldn't talk to them. I had no one to talk to. And to be honest, I missed the telephone calls I used to get at the office during the day. And I missed the ping from the, you know, the, from the emails coming and things like that. I felt lonely. I was all by myself. And what was very frustrating for me was that no one, not even my wife, who's pretty sharp, knows me very well or none of my friends could understand what I was going through because they automatically thought, well, Mike doesn't have to work anymore. He's got to be the happiest guy in the world. But I wasn't because it was the work that kind of made me happy. And I needed to find a way of replacing that or I was going to be in problem. But the worst time was at night because when I would go to bed at night, I would lie down and I would have this ringing in my ears from all the stress I was feeling you know, all the things that, you know, were coming at me during the day, and it was really bothering me a lot, and uh, eventually I would fall asleep after a period of time, but every morning I would wake up around 2, 2.30, and I couldn't sleep anymore, and that's when the fear started creeping, and you start getting these thoughts, and you start getting scared about different things, because you overthink everything, and, um, I remember once my, my wife, and she's, she's our investment advisor at home. She woke up and, and she said, uh, what's the problem? Why can't you sleep? And I said, I, I'm worried that maybe we didn't save up enough money for retirement. And she kind of just looked at me and said, go to sleep because we're fine. Now, she knew what fine meant because she paid all the bills at home and she managed our investments and things like that. So she had a pretty good handle on it, but I didn't know what fine meant. I had no idea. And, you know, because I couldn't match it to, to the cost of our lifestyle if we had enough to cover it out of anything like that. And until I figured out what fine meant, it, it always bothered me. I lost a lot of sleep over it. But... Um, you know, that's the way it was for a, uh, a period of time. And the only thing that pulled me out of retirement to uh, hell was I started working on a journal. So I would get up like four in the morning because I couldn't sleep anyways. And I would start journaling and putting my ideas down and starting putting together a plan and doing research on what I needed to do to get me out of retirement hell. How could I improve my life? How could I be happy again? And that journal turned into the book that uh, we're talking about today. So in the journal, I came up with the nine retirement principles, principles that I needed to fall to um, guarantee for myself 
a long and healthy life. You know, that was very important for me. And it's not just living long, it's living healthy longer. So you can do all the things that you love to do for as long, as long as possible. That was very important to me. And also I wanted to avoid any surprises in retirement. So I came up with principles to cover off those risks too. Because, you know, the worst thing you can do is, you know, you, you retire and, you know, you're surprised by a possible maybe a heart attack or a stroke. Or you're surprised because one day your, your wife at breakfast says, guess what, Mike, I want to have a divorce. These things come out of the blue sometimes. We're not even aware of it. We don't even think about these things. And, you know, it was very important for me to cover that off through the principles and also to put principles in there that would really maximize the amount of uh, happiness for me and meaning fulfillment in my retirement because I knew it was going to last a long time. One other thing I want to talk about before we actually go into the principles is about the current pandemic and about the important retirement lessons we gained uh, by, by experiencing the pandemic. And I'm going to refer to that as we go through the principles. But just think of these principles as the things you need to address to give you the best life possible in retirement. So principle number one, the importance of strong relationships. People throughout the world experienced this but during the pandemic when we had to self-isolate and we couldn't be with our families and friends. And a lot of people uh, were put on the fast track to depression because they couldn't do that. And especially, you know, it was concerning that say, you know, if your mother was in uh, a retirement home or long-term care and you couldn't see her and you know, you couldn't hug her or anything like that. It was just terrible. And a lot of people suffer through it. And the importance of strong relationships is so critical because it's been proven that having strong relationships and loving friends and family around you can reduce mortality risk up to 45%, which is, which is unbelievable when you think about it, 45% reduction in mortality risk. And there's a study that Harvard's uh, doing, it's still ongoing, it's the longest uh, study of its kind. And they've proved without a doubt that uh, the uh, quality and strength of your relationships uh, will determine how happy and healthy you are in retirement. So it's so important to understand that and make sure if uh, you don't have a lot of friends to get out there and make some new ones, because I guarantee you, if TV is your best friend, uh, you're going to have a problem. Okay. Now, here's another thing uh, we saw during the pandemic. When restraints were lifted in different parts of the world and people were free to move around again, they saw there was a spike in divorce rates. And the same thing happens in retirement. Uh, you know, when people retire and all of a sudden they're spending a lot more time together and they can't handle the increased uh, togetherness. And another thing that uh, could be a factor too is these two individuals could be two different types of retirees. So maybe one's comfort and they just wanna stay home and take it easy and the spouse could be a growth and they want to travel different parts of the world and go on vacations and experience all kinds of things. And they're going to end up butting heads. So the key is to have open communication and come up with compromises. So both of your needs are satisfied because that's the only way it's going to work. And you don't want to get divorced late in life because it's, it's very uh, uh, difficult to recover from it, both emotionally and financially. So this is one thing you want to avoid, but uh, you need to understand what could happen and you know, take the steps to make sure it doesn't happen. Principle number two, the importance of good health. This is very important because we know people, you know, older people or people of any age that had underlining illnesses were at higher risk of catching a virus and being end up in a hospital. And uh, the, the important thing to understand is we know a lot of these underlying illnesses are reversible through, um, you know, positive um, lifestyle habits, such as, you know, improving your nutrition and what you eat and, and uh, exercising on a regular basis. 
this is the normal progression of a person's health over time. And over, you know, every year, you might put on a little bit more weight. You might get uh, a little slower, have a lower energy level, and your health declines every year until finally you hit D date at some point. And for some people, they don't even make it that long because they hit get hit by a surprise, like I talked about. They could, you know, suffer from a heart attack or a stroke or whatever. And um, it doesn't have to be that way. That's the important takeaway here. Instead of uh, following that progression, it could look something like this. This graph is from a book called Younger Next Year. And it's a book I read by Chris Crowley. And uh, I was so excited after reading it because it changed my whole, whole point on, on aging and, and being healthy. You know, what they uh, taught me in the book was instead of falling that normal decline, instead you can get healthier and stronger every year uh, for a period of up to 10 years then you can maintain that level of health for a long period. And uh, you, know, you can push the decline further back. Everyone's gonna decline, but what you wanna do is push it back as far as possible for the period of decline is very short. So think of it in terms of uh, live long and die short. And that's what we're doing. And it, it's, you know, we know it works. And it's just the question of, uh, you know, eating healthy and working on a regular basis and following some other positive lifestyle habits. So that was music to my ears because that means it's controllable and I'm the one that can control it, right? So I started working out again. So, you know, when I retired, I started going to the pool, community pool, and I was swimming with a group of people doing a lane swim. And this is a married couple I swim with, uh, Carol and George. And I'll never forget the day I was there and Carol said, you know, Mike, it's my 80th birthday and I'm going to celebrate it by swimming 2000 yards today. And I went, what? You know, you're 80 and you're going to swim 2000 yards. And so she started swimming and I followed behind her and I was struggling because, you know, she had, she had, she was like the energizer bunny. You know, she kept swimming and swimming and she wasn't slowing down. And she swam those 2000 yards. And at the end of it, when I caught up to her, I gave her a hug and I said, Carol, when I'm your age, I wanna be just like you because you showed me, you proved that this, this stuff works. If you're willing to, to put the positive lifestyle habits in place and you're willing to do the work. Her husband, George, is, is quite the character. He, um, in his late 60s, he decided to take up this sport called triathlon. It's, a, it's an event where you, you swim and then you ride a bike and then you run at the end of it. And uh, it, 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 believe it or not, George is going to celebrate his 80th birthday by doing an Ironman in Cozabal, Mexico. And an Ironman is where you, you go out and I think you swim four kilometers. Then you get on a bike and you ride 112 miles. And then at the end of it, you run a full marathon, uh, 26.2 miles. And you all have to do it all in one day in under 17 hours to get a finisher's medal. And George will get it done. I know George. He believes in it. He does the work. He watches his health and what he eats and he'll get it done. And it just blows my mind that someone can do something like that at 80. And the oldest Ironman on record so far is 86. And every year there's someone that breaks that record, keeps breaking the records, keep pushing out the you know, health span on people. So I know this stuff is possible. And that, that really made me happy when I, when I um, recognized that. This is an interesting picture. It's the MRI of a, a calf muscle of, a, of a, you know, three different people. The top one is a 40 year old triathlete. And you can see how healthy it looks and you know, the healthy muscle and the lack of fat deposits and things like that. The one in the middle is of a 74 year old couch potato. And you can see the difference between the two you know, the, the lack of muscle definition and the fatty deposits and things like that. And then the one at the bottom is like a 70 year old triathlete like George. And if you look at it, 
it's almost identical to the 40 year old triathlete. So this is what I'm saying, these things are reversible and you can maintain that, that level of health for a long, long time. If, you, if again, if you're willing to do the work. Principle number three, the importance of financial independence. This is very important. You know, financial independence is the ability to do what you want, when you want, where you want, with who you want. And this is something that, you know, I'm teaching my kids and whatnot is forget about retirement, work towards uh, achieving financial independence. And then at that point, do whatever you want. You know, I, you know, a lot of people have their own definitions for wealth and being rich. And I've come up with my, uh, my own definition for living rich. And a lot of people think, you know, living rich is being able to drive a Ferrari or owning a house in the south of France. But living rich to me, based on, on, uh, on the work I've done, is, is being surrounded by loving family and friends and having the freedom to do what you want with your time. That's what living rich is. And that's what you want to take advantage of uh, in, in retirement. And what um, I think it's important to understand, once you gain financial independence, all the doors that were closed to you before when, when you were younger and you were working full time are now open again. So I, you know, I, I, I know this perfect story of uh, a friend of mine that when he was younger, he loved to paint. And then one day his father gave him the talk and said, look at son, you know, you want to one day, you know, you want to get married and you want to raise a family and things like that. And you can't do that by selling oil paintings because, you know, you, you know, you're not going to have a guaranteed income. So you need to go out and get a real job and make some real serious money for as long as you can. So the, you know, my friend, uh, he decided to go back to school and he became a chemical engineer and he he worked for a chemical company for 36 years till when he was packaged up. And when he got the severance check, like I did, he, he said to his wife, I'd like to use part of it to convert our loft into an art studio and start painting again, because I always had a passion for that. And I, I couldn't do it when I was working full time. She said she understood how important it was for him. And she said, go ahead, dear, you go ahead and try it. And without a word of lie today, he's making more money and having more fun selling oil paintings than he did in that chemical engineering job. And it just shows you when you can revisit your passions and you want to do these things, it's, it's unbelievable what you can achieve. So that was a beautiful story. And I, I hear stories like that all the time. One thing we want to do is avoid uh, lifestyle decline in uh, retirement. And that's why you're seeing a lot of people go back and work part-time in retirement or start their own businesses to generate some additional income. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I work uh, in retirement because I, I, I wanted to have an even better lifestyle than I did when I was working full-time because now the kids aren't home, the mortgage is paid off. So any money I make is I view it as fun money and I use that to do a lot of fun you know, things and have a lot of fun experiences with me and my family. But it's a decision that I made and it works for me. Plus my work, I don't view it as work. I view it as fun. It's like my play. So it's one and the same. So it's a win-win, but these are things that we need to think about. Principle number four, reigniting a sense of adventure. This is an important one because when we're working full-time, basically we're in survival mode. You know, we're trying to protect our job and make sure we don't lose it. And we're trying to, you know, not, you know, make as much money as we can want not. But, uh, you know, when, when that works, uh, you know, left behind, what we want to do is switch from uh, survival mode back into adventure mode and start living like kids again. You know, when, you know, we, we weren't scared to try new things. And, you know, we would go out and go on adventures and things like that. That's the mode we want to get back into. And we want to adopt a beginner's mindset again 
to start looking at new things and start experimenting and experiencing with new things. Maybe, in, you know, instead of watching just those cooking shows on TV, to actually go and cook some of the meals that we see them cooking and try it out with our friends or maybe go out and learn how to speak another uh, language like Spanish or learn to play a guitar or learn to do magic tricks for the grandkids and things like that, or travel the world and learn new things once the pandemic gets behind us. But that's where we want to change our, our thinking and switch into that adventure mode and start having a lot of fun again and trying new things. Think of it this way. Now here's a tough question. Think about when was the last time you did something for the first time? I bet you it's been a long time, hasn't it? And we want to do more of that in our retirements. And we want to try new things. That's the important thing, is to go out there, explore. Even if you fail, who cares, right? And uh, who knows? Maybe you can uh, bump into some new thing that you have a, a great deal of passion for. But you won't know that until you try, right? Principle number five, spirituality. Research has proven that people that belong to a faith-based community live up to nine years longer than others. And it makes sense because when you belong to a faith-based community, you know, you're, you, you know, you're associating or socializing with like-minded people. And uh, so you have a brief period of respite when you're together and you're, you know, you can, you know, shield off that uh, stress that you're feeling all the time and you get a break from life and you get to express uh, gratitude and feel good about things when, when you're, together with people like that. And it's been proven that the prayer is equivalent to uh, meditation or yoga. You get the same benefits from it. But another important point to make is that you don't need to go to church to practice spirituality. And this is a picture of me fishing up at the George River. It's way up in Northern Canada. It's above the tree line and um, it's where I go to get away, get off the grid and get away from iPhones and computers and the TV and the radio and all that, because nothing works up there. Basically, you're there with the river and the fish, and you spend all day by yourself thinking about things. It's almost like one of those, you know, you read about monks going on a retreat where they're not allowed to talk to anyone for a week, and they do that deep thinking and deep reflection and they gain new perspective. That's what happens to me at places uh, at like the George River. And, uh, you know, when I'm up there, it's, I know why they call it God's country now, because you feel connected to the universe and you feel closer to the God up there. And, you know, you come up with all these great things that you want to attempt, attempt when you come back to uh, the city, the civilization. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it renews me, it recharges me, and I have to go up there every year to do that. But it's so important in, in my happiness. Principle number six, the power of tribes. This is very important because it, it satisfies my need for socialization. And you can belong to more than one tribe to get a benefit from it. And it this is a picture of my bike tribe. We would go out every Sunday uh, pre-pandemic and go out for a couple of hour ride. And after that, we would sit down and have a coffee and talk about life and, and things like that. And it was so much fun. And the important thing to note in this picture is the mix, it's males and females and the difference in the ages. You know, our oldest uh, rider is 80 and the, our youngest is around 20. And it's so important to sit down with young and old people and and you know talk about things and swap ideas and it's almost like we act as mentors for the young people they keep asking us questions and then we learn from the young people too and some of their youngness rubs off on us and their attitude changes and improves and it's just a lot of fun so you know you know look into getting uh you know into uh tribes because it replaces the camaraderie that you used to have at work and you need to find a, a source of camaraderie and tribes is a great one. And it doesn't have to be like a bike tribe. I belong to a swimming tribe. I belong to Toastmasters. You can join a photography group. You can join a group that, you know, helps uh, you start a new business. There's so many different uh, types of tribes to, 
to join in. I, I urge you to take advantage of it. Principle number seven, time is your most precious asset. This is something we experienced during the pandemic when we had so much time on our hands, we didn't know what to do with it. And uh, every day seemed uh, similar to the next one. Do you know the routines? There wasn't much to do outside of just trying to survive, right? And uh, that's what happens when you retire. You have all this time freed up that you used to spend at work and you need to find uh, good outlets for that time. Because if you don't, you're going to be bored and you're going to be miserable. And you have to understand that not all time is the same. Quality of time changes over time. So when, at, you know, when you begin your retirement and, you know, say you're 65, you're going to be able to do a lot of different things. But as you get older, you know, things are going to change. Maybe you won't want to take that long plane ride to Australia to visit some relatives and things like that. Maybe you'll just want to slow down and spend more time around house. And so it's, you know, the quality of time, the things you can do with your time are diminished. So it's important to understand that too. Principle number eight, purpose. This is one of the big rocks of retirement because everyone needs a good reason to get out of bed in the morning. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, everyone needs a sense of purpose. And it's been proven people have a sense of purpose reduce more mortality risk by up to 15%, which is significant. And, uh, you know, all three types of retirees need a sense of purpose in their lives, but they're going to be different degrees of purposes. Purposes come in different sizes and shapes, and then many people have more than one purpose. During the pandemic, if you couldn't work at home, you know, people experienced uh, a, the loss of a sense of purpose. And, you know, outside of maybe taking the dog out for another walk around the block, they were getting bored like crazy. And many of them woke up to the fact that having a job, any type of job was far better than just sitting at home trying to kill time. So it opened people's eyes to say, hey, we need purpose. We need something to do, to do in retirement. We need something interesting and meaningful and fulfilling, or we're going to be bored. And we experienced it during the pandemic, and we don't want any part of that. Principle number nine, healthy aging is all about attitude. This is a uh, good news if you, if you have a um, you know, positive attitude because it's been proven that positive people live up to seven and a half years longer than negative people. And um, it, it's, uh, you know, one thing about retirement is, is that, you know, at age 65, you know, you know, we've been sold on this idea that, oh, we're old and we're supposed to slow down. We're supposed to play it safe and all this stuff. And it's just negative, negative, negative stuff. And you can't buy into that. You can't listen to it. You know, you have to look at it differently because if you think retirement's going to suck, guess what? It will. But Instead of that, if you look at it from a positive uh, uh, approach, if you look at the possibilities and if you're excited about retirement because now you're free to do all these fun things that you couldn't do before and you're going to start doing them, well, retirement's going to be great and you're going to have a great time. It all depends how you look at it and what you believe it, retirement to be about. And, and these are just basically some of my retirement beliefs. Uh, you know, I believe this period of life could be the best of, of them all. And what age you are doesn't matter because you're still working in uh, progress, right? You know, you're going to be changing and, you know, you know, there's unlimited possibilities to what you could do. And it's just up to you if you want to go after them or not. And I know by following the retirement uh, principles, I'm going to enjoy a long, uh, healthy and uh, exciting life. And I believe working at something I love doing is going to help keep me alive. It's going to be like my own personal fa uh, fountain of youth. And I believe that most retirements fail due to a lack of imagination and belief in what is possible. And so much is possible. I see it all the time. And the only thing holding me back from a great retirement is me eliminating myself, not believing in what I'm capable of, not believing the possibilities that are out there for me. And the possibilities are endless. And it's okay to be a little crazy in retirement. And I keep telling people, don't worry about what other people think about you. Because you no longer have a boss looking 
you know, at what you're doing. And you no longer get performance reports uh, on an annual basis and all that. It's just you. Just be concerned about you. Like, don't worry what other people are thinking or, or saying about you because it doesn't matter anymore. And it's time to consider becoming a retirement rebel. And I just love retirement rebels like Eleanor here. She went and celebrated her 100th birthday by going out in skydiving for the first time. So can you imagine Eleanor there at the retirement home? She's having breakfast with her friends and said, I'm celebrating my 100th today. I'm going skydiving. Would you like to come along? <laughs> what would people say to that, right? But she went out and did it. And that's what I love about these people because they're not scared to try new things. And we're seeing all kinds of uh, examples of this. We're seeing you know, people going out and starting new businesses in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And we're seeing people going to different countries and running marathons and doing whatever they want. They're doing volunteer work. And then they post about it all on social media. And it's so interesting to see what they're doing. And retirement rebels ripped up the retirement rule book and they're just living life the, the, the way they want. And they want to have an exciting, fulfilling retirement. And I have to change this picture now because a, a lady in Australia, when she turned 102, just broke Eleanor's record. And that's happening all the time. All these records that people are are setting are being broken by additional retirees that are looking at what these people are doing say hey i can do that there's no reason i can't do it and that's when their thoughts about retirement turn around they get excited about it. and these are the stories i love to hear because they really get me excited and they give me a lot to look forward to retirement lifestyle design this is what i do with my wife she's an investment advisor and uh, I sit down for clients about three to five years before they retire. And in that initial meeting, I say to them, tell me your vision about retirement. And I get back this, this, this deer in the headlight look because they don't know what they wanna do in retirement. They haven't got a clue. And I laugh because when I was in their shoes, I didn't know either. So what I do is I give them copies of both my books. I say, here, read these. And then when you're finished, we'll have a, a follow-up meeting. And when they have that meeting, they're all excited because they have all these ideas of uh, things they want to try and the kind of lifestyle they want to join retirement. And then we sit down and we actually start designing out a couple of different lifestyle scenarios for people. And uh, you know we draw them out. And then we come, we come up with the optimal one, the one that they, they decide that's best for them. And then what we do is, you know, and that lifestyle design is based on what a perfect day would look like for them, perfect uh, week, month, and a year. And then we put those pieces together and we actually cost them up. So we say, okay, Maybe you want to go on a couple of trips a year and you want to join a gym and you want to join this uh, tribe. And this is what it's going to cost you to do all those things. And I'm just going to pick a number. Say that number is 60000 after tax. And then we go to the investment advisor and we say, okay, we need 60000 after tax to make this lifestyle happen. Do we have enough in, in in retirement assets to, to cover those costs. And the investment advisor is so excited because they actually have a number to work with now. So no one's guessing because we actually know dollar for dollar what it's gonna cost. And then when the advisor comes back and says, yeah, you have enough, you should see their eyes light up and they go, wow, I can afford this lifestyle, my dream lifestyle. And at that point, they never worry about money again because they finally, for the first time in their lives, can say, I have enough. I don't have to ever worry about maybe needing a little bit more. Like I felt when I was lying in bed and I couldn't sleep. They know they have enough so they can focus on their retirement future, the lifestyle that they're going to retire to. So maybe they made a decision, we'll retire in two years. 
So for those two years, they're dreaming about that, that retirement lifestyle they designed and they're looking forward to it. And when they actually do retire, they can hit the ground running because they know exactly what they're going to do. And they start living right away instead of wasting a couple of years of prime retirement uh, time figuring things out. So that's the beauty of it. And it's so exciting to see, you know, clients uh, figure things out like that for themselves. And it takes all the guesswork out of retirement. And that's what I really enjoy. And uh, this is the last slide. It's just my email contact information. If you should have, have any questions after the presentation we can't get to, you can just send me a note. I'll be happy to answer it. And boomingencore.com is where I do my blog. I write a weekly blog and there's all kinds of retirement information there and stories. So feel free to visit it. And that's it, Pam. Oh, that's great, Mike. I mean, these are things we've been hearing, but I mean, when you put it into uh, practical stories, I mean, things that you're hearing all over, um, it really, it really does begin to make sense. I want to just uh, bring up a couple things. Um, Cindy, could you uh, now allow anybody who has their camera on to be seen? You can take <laughs> take Mike off of uh, Spotlight and maybe we'll see some people. I'd like to call on Nancy. Nancy, can you, um, are you still on the call and can you turn your camera on, your video? Yes, if you mean Nancy Hale, I'm still here. Nancy Hale, Nancy made a very important point, uh, Mike, and uh, I'd like her to address it. When you talked about the importance of finding your tribe, Nancy wrote in the chat, Women have been doing this for a long time. So Nancy, tell us, tell us more about that. Um, I, and I, I realized, I, I hope uh, Mike that you didn't take that as a snarky remark. It was more oh. like, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just think that women for generations and centuries have been um, finding groups for themselves whether uh, it's um, working, being working moms, being raising children, being pregnant, you know, whatever it is, I think that that's what women have been very good at doing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you for acknowledging that that's an important part of staying healthy and throughout our lives. Sure, sure. And if I could add to what you said, Nancy. I think, you know, I really believe that women we'll have an easier time uh, transitioning to retirement because they do have health support groups in place. Guys, on the other hand, don't. And uh, that's why they struggle because they tend to, they were raised, they were brought up, you know, to believe they had to go it alone. They couldn't admit that, you know, they had a problem or they were scared or things like that. I call it the John Wayne kind of syndrome. And they have a problem with that. And the good thing is we're starting to see support groups created for men that are struggling with retirement transition to get them talking and to say, it's okay to feel like this and to be a support group. But yeah, we're, we're basically copying what you've been doing for years, right? I'd like to ask Terry Quinn to come on. Terry, if you could... Uh... Uh, unmute yourself and put your camera on. And um, Terry is the facilitator of our coming of age men's group. And I just want him to say a few things about what this means to the retired men that have been meeting for two and a half years now. Are you on Terry? I thought I saw him on. Anyway, we started the men's group two and a half years ago. I began reading that. Hey, I'm sorry. Better. There we go. Terry, tell us a little bit about what this men's group has meant to, to many of you. Well, what we did a few, about, about two years ago was bring together a group of about 50 guys from all different backgrounds. And I think many of them struggled with the common issues that we all have. What's our next step in retirement? How do I face the challenges? And I guess what struck me with Mike's presentation today is that uh, his principles of retirement hit home with me on every one of them. So I said, bingo, this guy is, is on the money. So Mike, I wanna thank you for that. 
uh, our men's morning group uh, practices a lot of these principles because they make a great deal of sense. Um, we look forward to our men's group. It meets every, every other week for the last two years. And the most interesting part is, as you say, Mike, we need a tribe. This is our tribe. And even in the pandemic, they say, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, the pandemic did not allow us to meet in person. We found a way. Now we meet religiously by way of Zoom. And um, yeah, it keeps going. In fact, the thing has, has expanded. It's no longer just a Thursday. We have another group that meets on Tuesdays because there is such a need for this to stay connected with your tribe. You know, Terry, it's very true. And I'll tell you, you'd have a lot more members if you could get the word out. It's just a matter of people being aware of it. Because like you said, a lot of people would love to be part of it. You know, yeah. men especially because they're struggling. They have a hard They are. Especially for men. I think yeah. it, it's hard, harder for men. Scott says that his tribe is the ultimate Frisbee players. <laughs> I love that. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, when you talked about retirement rebels, uh, there's a wonderful new movie out. It's getting a lot of press and it's called Duty Free about an older woman, 75 years, years old. I think for the past 30 to 40 years, she's been in hotel housekeeping and she's risen to being the head housekeeper. Okay. And all of a sudden they lay her off. Now yeah. she's been supporting a schizophrenic son, um, she's, you know, struggled. She's never had a lot, but she's been able to manage that. And she absolutely goes into a downward spiral and her son comes along the other son and sits down with her and says, I want you to make a list because you have time now. She knew she was going to have a hard time getting a job, but she did still pursue trying to get another job. And he said, I want you to make a list of all the things you couldn't do when you were working. And she makes this long list uh, about reuniting with a daughter she gave away as a small child, about learning uh, hip hop dancing, about skydiving, about um, she's done, she had all these, and the son takes her with him and makes those dreams and those delayed passions come true for her and it completely turns her whole personality around beautiful movie it so, is a great movie duty free in new york city it's playing at the i think the uh, ifc i think you can might also be able to get it online but but try to do that the, the other thing i wanted to ask you mike is um and i think you made a great point about how important it is to maintain intergenerational connections but if you don't have any exposure to younger people, where do you find that? Well, you, you know, it, then again, it's joining tribes where there's a mix. Mm. And there's all kinds of tribes that you can join where you're going to see a good cross section of, of uh, people like that. But you have to search them out on purpose because hanging around young people is good for you because some of that youngness will rub off on you. I, I tell you. It, and it's just such a positive thing because they keep you thinking positive about things, right? And they keep, you know, you can learn from, them, especially technology. You're like, you know, who do I learn from? My kids, right? <laughs> They're my IT support group. Yes. But I want to make one point, and, and this is so important because I think work has been given a bad rap because we view work as something we have to do to make money to get through life. But in our second life here, we look at work differently. It's almost a form of play. The key is to find work that you love to do. And I, I'm not joking when I said it serves as a personal uh, fountain of youth for people, provided they're doing the, the right work that they enjoy doing. And if you look, you know, I got into this bad habit of reading obituaries. And I, I look for people that lived a long life. So, you know, maybe a hundred plus. And if you look at their, their past histories, you'll see in many cases, 
they either worked late or volunteered late in life. And I really believe it was participating in the world, you know, mattering, doing meaningful things, finding ways of giving back to others in the community. That's what keeps you alive. That's what keeps you happy. And that's where you hit, instead of happiness, you actually live a joyful life. And that's a game changer. So that's why I keep telling people, look at it differently and see how you could find sources of that because the payoff's tremendous. Right, right. Can you give us the full name of the author of Younger Next Year? Oh, it's Chris Crowley, C-R-O-W-L-E-Y. See, I actually have it right here. And the other co-author was Henry Lodge, L-O-D-G-E. Not Henry Cabot Lodge. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Henry S. Lodge. Great. But it's just a, it's a great book and it really changed my view on, in, on the aging process. And I said, wow, you know what? It doesn't have to be that regular period of decline. I can change it. And I'm working hard at it. As a matter of fact, I'm signed up for my own Ironman next November, next year. Ooh. I have to lose 53 pounds for <laughs> Good luck with that, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> so stay tuned. Follow my blog and keep yes. your fingers crossed for me. Um, now, Nancy said she has one more question about financial diversity. Nancy? Hi, here I am. Um, so, Mike, I don't know whether in your um, in the consulting that you do, if you come across this, and maybe not, since folks, I'm guessing that there's a there's a fee that you charge for for the consulting that you do. Um, but I guess I just wanted to put out there that there's some uh, of us, I'll include myself, um, on more uh, limited limited resources or limited incomes where it might be necessary in order to reach that financial independence that you talk about, which is so important, that need to make some changes or choices or find, uh, it, it might be a little bit more challenging um, than say someone who got a severance package at, you know, uh, at a kind of traditional sure. retirement age or, or something like that, or was, was laid off or whatever. Um, and so sometimes I think that can be more of a challenge. I think it can still be successful, but I didn't know whether you've run into that yourself in your consulting or whether you have any thoughts about that. No, you know, basically the world's changed because, because of uh, longevity, uh, you're going to be in retirement for a longer period. So in the old days, you know, you might spend five, 10 years in retirement. And in the old days, people weren't that healthy. They weren't that active. So they were more passive and they just kind of stayed at home and, and took it easy. But today, people could spend just as much time in retirement as they do in their working years. And the numbers don't work anymore. Because it, how do you finance uh, acceptable retirement that could last 30 years based on 30 years of work. But not too many people talk about that. So that's putting a lot of stress on people because they're saying, well, I can't afford that kind of retirement they're showing me in these, those uh, commercials, right? And what they have to kind of wake up to the fact is that maybe they'll have to work part-time in retirement to supplement their income. And my point is that's not a bad thing. It provided you find the right type of work for yourself that you enjoy doing, because then it's not like the old style work and it's less stressful because it's part time and uh, you continue on for as long as you can. Like I've created work for myself that I'm not going to retire from because I enjoy doing it so much and it pays me some money. So, you know, I can finance those other things that I want to do. There's but, a whole major shift in the world of work right now. Yeah. And it, what it means and what it's showing is that more people want to stay on their job That's right. um, or find a job where, they're, where they have some meaning and purpose or they have to work because they haven't saved enough for retirement. And what's happening is, um, you know, I think this just came out in the paper this week about the birth rate is down. We're right. gonna have a heck of a lot more older people who are going to be able to pick up the slack and bring their expertise and offer something to, to businesses 
um, than young people are to come along and take their place. Oh yeah, and there's, so there's it's a, a phenomenon. It's yeah. a shift. But well, what I, what I would you know give a heads up to people that you know as you're re uh, approaching retirement age and you plan on continuing to work at something or maybe start something new is to do the prep work before you retire. So if you need to go back to school and, and learn some new skills or things like that, or you need to upgrade your knowledge of uh, technology and things like that, uh, do it sooner than later. So then it will ease the transition. And that's why I like, you know, a lot of people talk about ageism and everything like that. And I say, that's why I kind of like people starting their own businesses, right? Because then ageism isn't a factor. You know, you're in control, you're doing it. And it's really kind of neat to see the different services people provide or products they're selling. And, you know, it's easy to sell it over the internet these days, but they're just being creative about it, right? And they're having fun at it and they're making some money at it. And I, I think that's the way to go, right? But it needs, you got to think about this before and you got to prepare it before. And then you reduce the risk if you know if you're pushed out or whatever or you lose your job. So many poor people lost jobs during the pandemic. It's it's really rough. Right? It, there's a it's a national organization called SCORE comes under the Small Business Administration and it's terrific because they offer free consultations with people who want to start their own business and help them develop business plans and guide them along and whatever has to be done in terms of marketing. So that's, that's another wonderful resource if you're thinking of starting your own business. Yeah, we need more, more of, uh, you, know, you know, companies like that providing assistance. In Canada, it's so frustrating because I can't find a place like that. Like, show me a source where I can go and they're going to teach me how to uh, create a website for myself, right? And I like the word free. Like, this should be sponsored <laughs> through the government up here. And so I could come in and say, okay, here's my idea. And then they could give me resources and say, okay, let's make that thing come true. And let's work towards it. And then it's up to me to put the effort in, right? But that's what people are asking for. But, you know, until someone says we're willing to do it and support you, it's, you know, people are going to struggle and it's not right. Exactly. You've given us a lot to think about, Mike. And I, I think we, we, we really need to hear positive comments like yours and encouragement and uh, being able to look ahead and look forward to rather mm -hmm. than to worry about. Um, so everybody go out and get Mike's book and sign up for consulting with him and uh, come back to another coming of age uh, or PSS Life U event, pssusa.org slash events. You'll see that this will be recorded uh, and it will appear on our YouTube channel and you can listen to it again. Mike, someone had asked about whether or not your PowerPoint slides would be available. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't release them because some of those are, are intellectual property. And yeah, <laughs> I get in trouble. I didn't know that until someone said, no, you can't do that. All right. <laughs> My knuckles wrapped a little bit on that one. But if anyone has any questions, like I said, and it's for free, it's gratis, I just like helping people. Uh, and I, I want them not to have to go through the stressful period I went through trying to figure everything out. So right. if you have a question, don't be shy. Send me an email and I'll try to help you to the best of my ability. Right. So thank you so much, Mike. Um, it, we really appreciated the time this afternoon that you gave to us. And thank you to all of you who had good questions and just sat sat in with us and learn something today. I hope you go out and make a change, one small change, and then you're on your way. Thank you again, and uh, hope to see you in the um, bestseller list soon. <laughs> I don't know about that one, Pam. <laughs> good luck, good luck to you. Nice to meet you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, bye. bye.